Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 111, May 1st to May 7th, 1863. Last week, we had a couple of major events around Vicksburg. Grant is going to have pulled off getting his men on the right side of the river, ready to move inland and get at the rebels. We also had action in Missouri at Cape Girardeau. This week, we have a full episode because the time has finally arrived to fight the Battle of Chancellorsville. I feel we have not done quite as much in terms of setup as we have for other battles, so let's spend the first part here doing some additional background. Before we kick off, though, let's talk about the Patreon just a little bit. And uh, we are turning the leaf over to a new month here. That's the month of May. Uh, And we're going to do some content revolving around the first day at Chancellorsville. Went out to a trail there, some land that's been preserved by the American Battlefield Trust. So took a little picture slideshow and put that together and have some commentary on there and uh, talk about the trails that are on specifically the first day. I know there's more for the next two days, but um, I'm focusing primarily on the first day. So I think it's going to pair very nicely. That should be posted uh, fairly soon here. So that way you can compare that to the actual episode. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, the Patreon link is in the show description and your support for the show is greatly appreciated. When we left off in the east, Hooker had successfully flanked Lee and was gathering his forces at Chancellorsville. Richard Anderson's men were initially in a position to defend against the oncoming Yankees, but they would be pulled back by Lee. Lee, as we mentioned, had a choice to make. Sedgwick and 40,000 men will be potentially crossing the Rappahannock, preparing themselves at Fredericksburg. Now, this should have been great news because they would be assaulting once again Murray's Heights, and there could potentially be a repeat of the action in December. But now, Meade and Slocum were in the rear of the rebel army, something that Burnside probably would have gladly welcomed. Longstreet would be sent for, but as we mentioned, he was sieging Suffolk. He could not simply break off that action and head up to north of Richmond. For one, he needed to call back in his supply wagons and then get his divisions in a situation where they could safely pull out of their positions. Stuart would also be recalled to a location where he could have a better contact with his superior. Having a good idea of the enemy troop strength was necessary, so the cavalry was valuable. In addition, Edward Porter Alexander and his artillery was called in from their winter quarters. Remember, the Army of Northern Virginia was dispersed, so Lee needed to mass his numbers. This had been because of the supply issues that campaigning for prolonged periods of time would present for Central Virginia. But just as Lee needed to concentrate, so too did Hooker wish to do the same. While Anderson and his men were withdrawing to get into better defensive positions, there would be some skirmishing involving the Federal Cavalry. Stuart would actually clash with some of the Union troopers on the night of the 30th, brushing them away, still giving the superiority in that department to the Confederates. Part of this was because Stoneman was trying to raid the communications route of the rebel army. We will get into Stoneman's activity in a minute, which is one of the factors that goes into Hooker's pause. Meade was ready to take the fight to the Confederates, and very well could have broken Lee before he was ready. With not one but two corps and more reinforcements on the way against just Anderson, these would have been indeed very good odds. Slocum, though, had received orders to take over for that contingent and remain where they were. Hooker wanted to get all of his ducks in a row. Some roads were poor, so it was not easy going, getting all of his troops into position. He's not familiar with the ground and, of course, wants Stoneman to complete his task. 
Speaking of the ground, though, we should mention that the area around Chancellorsville, which is really just the Chancellor House, is heavily wooded. In fact, it is known as the Wilderness, and will be the site of the 1864 battle of the same name. It would be hard to maneuver and hard to use artillery to its most effectiveness. Meade wanted to get out of that terrain so that there could be a better ground to spread out. Hooker, though, was on his way to take over at the Chancellor House, ready to launch his assault on May 1st. Before leaving his headquarters on the other side of the Rappahannock, though, he would leave orders for Sedgwick to be aggressive in his action on the 1st. Stonewall Jackson and his men were ready for a fight, bedding down on the 30th, not knowing how the next day would go. Let's remove ourselves from the bodies of infantry for a moment and take a look at what George Stoneman is going to be up to for the next few days. Now, Stoneman was not quite so effective as a cavalry commander and will be in part blamed for Hooker's defeat, although, in fairness, it's not entirely all his fault. During his cavalry raid, his primary purpose is to cut off supplies coming into Lee's Army of Northern Virginia via the RF&P Railway. Hooker would give specific instructions to his cavalry wing as to how to accomplish this task. But Stoneman is not going to be able to succeed. He will swing out well wide, and then take his time cutting in behind the Confederates. Stoneman will be cautious after skirmishing with small amounts of rebel cavalry, capturing Louisa, a pretty unimportant target along the Central Railroad, which was only secondary in terms of his objectives. At Thompson Station, he will break his command into several columns. Now, these columns will do well in harassing the Virginia countryside. Percy Wyndham was sent a little further west to take out bridges and canal locks. Judson Kilpatrick would aggressively ride to the outskirts of Richmond. His success in burning a depot was only stopped as he neared the outer defenses. Hasbrook Davis would also make his way through the rebel lines cutting near Ashland, and back to friendlier territory near Yorktown at Gloucester Point. Stoneman and John Gregg would run into Rooney Lee at a place called Shannon Hill, Stoneman wishing to then return to Union lines. Bridges and supplies were burned in several areas, as well as prisoners captured and paroled, Kilpatrick and Davis actually severing the RFNP during their portions of the raid. But the damage done was not a crippling blow, but rather a minor hindrance that would do well to cause a panic amongst the citizenry. Much of the railroad would be repaired in around the same amount of time it took to conduct the damage. William Averill and his command would be recalled by Hooker when things started to go south. Averill actually being removed from command in the process, probably unfairly. There are many errors of the raid overall, though. Stoneman certainly does not have a sense of urgency in his movements, as well as follows dated orders as opposed to the new directives. Hooker fails to let him know what is going on in his neck of the woods and sticks to his original orders, not adapting to new developments. It is one of the more interesting events of Chancellorsville, and not well known a kind of mini Grierson raid, if you will, that goes toward increasing the confidence of federal cavalry, as well as exposing the soft-shelled rebel defenses. Our two takeaways are going to be this, though. Hooker thinks that any day, rebel traffic will be disrupted. This means no supplies and no James Longstreet showing up. When that happens, Lee is hopefully going to retreat, allowing for his army to pursue. So with that being the overall plan, let's keep that in the back of our minds as we go through the battle. Back to the action on the 1st. Lee is going to decide to force battle with Hooker's forces that have been amassed at Chancellorsville. Hooker, on the other hand, is convinced that he could push all the way to the defenses around Fredericksburg. This is partly why the Union Army will not press their advantage once they realize of the successful flanking march they conducted. Now, Lee and Jackson, as we know, are both aggressive and unconventional commanders, 
Hooker assumes that Lee is going to do the conventional thing and withdraw into defenses. Confederate numbers are some 60,000 compared to Hooker's 133, which are long odds indeed. In fact, F.J. Hooker is going to have a larger advantage than any of his predecessors had enjoyed. So we can therefore leisurely stroll out of the woods and get prepared to assault the Confederates, who may be withdrawing anyway because Stoneman is cutting off their supplies. Therefore, we should get ready to chase them. But Lee is going to leave Jubal early of some 11,000 men at his defensive works in Fredericksburg and arrive with the rest of his army to contest just such a movement. Anderson and McClaws will be in place, joined by Jackson, who is commanding divisions under A.P. Hill, Robert Rhodes, and Raleigh Colson. Colson was actually born in France and attended VMI. His inexperience is going to lead to being relieved of command. After the war, Colson will go on to serve in the Egyptian army with William Ling Loring. It's interesting to note we should take a pause here and just talk about how this plan of action by Lee contrasts greatly with what we're going to talk about here as we get closer to the Siege of Vicksburg, right? Like, Hooker thinks that Lee is going to consolidate his forces, dig in, and just sort of wait for the army to come to him. And in essence, that's not exactly what happens in the Vicksburg campaign, but it's ultimately what does occur. And those are going to be not even as long odds as here in the East. So we see that there could have been an opportunity to maybe try something different, try to do a little bit more. And the opportunity is, of course, successful here, but not so successful in the West. Meade will move out on May 1st by sending Sykes' division of regulars down the Orange Turnpike. Charles Griffin and his men tracking north to secure another crossing of the Rappahannock River. Richard Anderson's Confederates had made a defensive line along Mott's Run, near the Zone Baptist Church, but they were expected not to be there. Jackson had arrived and was commanding the field. The Confederates would be out in front of these positions, ready to meet their enemy, as they exited the trees. Sykes and his men would unexpectedly run into the enemy. At this point, the division is made up of veteran troops, brigades of Ayers and Burbank leading the way, supported by a brigade of New York regiments under one Patrick O'Rourke. Around the Lewis farm just off the turnpike, the Federals would make contact with Kershaw and Billy Mahone's troops. This contingent, and that of Alpheus Williams on the Plank Road, would see some success. The Rebels would actually be pushed almost to Mott's Run. Hooker, though, would be shaken by the fact he was being attacked by the Confederates. He would call off the assaults and pull back. Robert Rhodes and his men would flank Sykes coming from the Plank Road, advancing on the turnpike to great success. There is a monument to the 11th U.S. Regulars now on the preserved land today. Facing this stiff resistance, the 5th Corps Division would fall back, supported by Zook and Caldwell of Hancock's division to stabilize the retreat. In fact, Hancock was able to conduct a fighting retreat perfectly, acting as a rear guard. Further south, Alpheus Williams of the 12th Corps would run into Richard Anderson's men on the Orange Plank Road. Williams, likewise, would be turned away by Hooker, which opened up roads to hit Sykes in the flank. There are actually some who believe that if that more resources had been put into Alpheus Williams advancing on the Plank Road, then the first day goes very, very differently. Union casualties were some 261, mostly suffered by Sykes regulars, as they were engaged and then flanked by the rebels. At the end of the first day of the battle, Hooker is still positive. He can now set up a defensive position and force Lee to meet him on the ground of his choosing. Remember that he is adverse to frontal assaults like Fredericksburg. Maybe he can recreate the success at Malvern Hill. But his subordinates are not so sure. Darius Couch, the second in command of the army, would write, The retrograde movement had prepared me for something of the kind, but to hear from his own lips 
that the advantages gained by the successful marches of his lieutenants were to culminate in fighting a defensive battle in that nest of thickets was too much, and I retired from his presence with the belief that my commanding general was a whipped man. We have already mentioned the disadvantage of the terrain, as Couch says. Lee and Jackson were willing to use that to their own advantage, and in the process, they would not let Fighting Joe fight on the ground of his choosing. Instead, they would make the ground themselves. Jackson and Lee met in a fateful and documented meeting, in which they sat first on a log, and in the evening on a cracker box. Jackson was animated. He wanted to get at the enemy. Earlier in the day, he had tried to move his men to Hazel Grove, high ground the Union now enjoyed. From this elevated position, Jackson and Stuart had received artillery fire. But Stonewall was not to be outdone. His plan was to use local guides, of which there were some on hand, to navigate around the Union flank and then come in on the rear. They could use these lesser-known roads and then come in behind the Federals, an attack where the Orange Turnpike intersected the Orange Plank Road at a place called Wilderness Church. Further down the turnpike was Chancellorsville, built to be a way station on that route. Jackson had sent his mapmaker, Jedediah Hotchkiss, to find the proprietor of the Catherine Furnaces, Charles Welford, which now sat a little to the front of the Union defensive line. Welford had been using the furnace for the Confederate war effort, and was willing to help Jackson in his schemes. His son would be the guy that Stonewall was seeking. There was a way to use a couple of different roads to swing in behind the Federals. Remember that Stoneman is not with the army, so Hooker does not have a lot of cavalry. Lee does have Stuart, who can now be used to his advantage. The Federal flank, much as it had been in the Seven Days, was in the air. Now we should mention the makeup of the Federal Army. The 12th, 5th, and 3rd Corps, Slocum, Meade, and Sickles, were making a defensive line around Chancellorsville. That left Howard and the 11th Corps to be the rear or extreme right flank. With Howard, we some extensive baggage, and I actually mean that in the literal sense, not the figurative. He was told not to bring as much in terms of supplies, which he didn't listen to, and now he lags behind the rest of the army as a result. Hooker, oddly enough, was trying to remove the 11th Corps from the fighting altogether. This corps was not considered to be a crack unit, being Siegel's old command, full of German immigrants and second-generation Germans. Howard had his men along the turnpike, but the majority of his line was facing south ready to meet a potential rebel threat from that direction. There would only be a few units that faced west, under Leopold von Gliese, from Charles Devon's command. Devon's would be intoxicated, reportedly, from the oncoming engagement, his not being a good story since we first met him at Ball's Bluff, if you can remember that. If Lee could keep Hooker from attacking, which he fully expected him to do, then their move could be pulled off. He already had divided his army once with Early, still back near Fredericksburg, but now he was ready to do it again. Jackson would speak with his superior. Lee signed off on Jackson's attack, his subordinate leaving him McClaws and Anderson. These divisions would be crucial in holding Hooker's men in place. With Early, there would be some confusion in orders. Lee had commanding him to use his discretion for remaining where he was, but his staff failed to convey that correctly, instead making it an order to withdraw and join Lee. Early was confused, but would make the appropriate preparations. John Sedgwick, again, was not entirely clear on what he was supposed to do. His orders to attack came late in the day, so he did not jump off. He would be still confused yet again on May 2nd. Now, there is a lot of play in terms of the problems that the Union Army has with communicating with the separated contingents during the Battle of Chancellorsville, and we often overlook sometimes just how difficult it was 
if you split your army like that, it's hard to communicate, right? Like in the modern day, we can just pick up a phone or, you know, have a radio, right? But they did not have that. So there's a lot of problems in terms of getting things together. And oftentimes we see this throughout the war where it's even better to just actually have a face-to-face meeting and get the orders that way. And so there's, there's no way that you can misinterpret them. May 2nd would see Jackson's column move out. In their absence, Lee would expand his front to make the illusion that the Confederates still occupied their lines. Jackson would wish to make the march as silent as possible. His men could only march on the road some four abreast, so the going was slow and there would be some traffic jams. Jackson would be near the front, leading the troops into position with Robert Rhodes. Now, oddly enough, the Union Army were relatively aware that there was some kind of movement. Daniel Sickles and his corps sat in their lines near Catherine Furnace. It was the Furnace Road where the column was leading around. A gap in the trees exposed the moving rebels. As a result, Sickles requested to engage the enemy, but precious time elapsed before Hooker responded. All Sickles could do at that point was then lob some shells at the marching gray troops. Because of this, the baggage and artillery of some 33,000 men would take a longer trek southward so they could avoid being targeted by the northern gunners. One regiment of Georgia troops, the 23rd, was left at the furnace to seal off the retreat there. These men would be engaged by a brigade of Federals and Burdan sharpshooters, who did good work in pushing the outnumbered Georgians from their positions. Emory Best, the commanding officer of these men, would withdraw to a railroad cut before breaking and running. Some of the Georgians stayed where they were, the Federals capturing some 260 or so of them. But other than that regiment, there were no other rebels. Captured Georgians would chide the Yankees that Jackson had something planned for them. Reports arrived that the wagons were turned in a southern direction. Hooker surmised that the rebels must be retreating. Jackson could be heading for Orange Courthouse. Stonemen should have been cutting off their supplies, so this was a logical conclusion to make. Hooker would then make Howard aware of these men moving south, and then to be careful for his flank. Howard would afterwards deny ever having received such a communication. Jackson's troops would rest in the woods, ready to come right down the Orange Turnpike, where Howard and his men were lounging, weapons stacked, and supplies filling any available space. Skirmishers would inform superiors there was something going on, but it was concluded that it was simply Confederate cavalry, which had been operating in the area. There was a perfect storm for Lee and Jackson. No enemy cavalry, the flank in the air, subpar Federal troops, the right commanders in Howard and Hooker, the stage was set for the masterstroke. For the Confederates, Fitzhugh Lee had personally led Jackson to view the Union line, the rebels needing to move around the fixed positions of the Federals and onto their exposed flank. At 5.15, Jackson would ask Rhodes if everything was ready. Rhodes would emphatically reply in the affirmative, Jackson giving him the go-ahead. He had given his last dispatch to Lee, saying they were in position and would attack if practicable. The roads would move his men out of the trees. Preceding them were all kinds of animals to the amazement of the Federals. They were less amazed when they heard the rebel yell rising from the attackers. Many of the 11th Corps would run without firing a shot. Von Gilsa's men were quickly overwhelmed. Howard was not with his command, having promised the brigade of Francis Barlow to Sickles for his planned assault on Catherine Furnace. Now, why exactly Howard needed to lead one brigade from his corps to another corps? That is an interesting question and one that he gets criticized for, but perhaps it was simply trying to find something to do, right? Because his corps is essentially in the rear of the army. Rushing back to the scene, he would find a flag, grabbing it with his one arm in an attempt to rally his men. Rhodes had been followed up by Raleigh Colston's line, 
A.B. Hill's men still arriving by the time the attack kicked off. Daylight was precious, and the rebels were losing it rapidly. Hooker quickly recalled Sickles as the Federals tried to cobble together a defense. Some Federal officers were more than eager to shoot the escaping 11th Corps men who did not rally. Some did attempt to make a stand, including Adolphus Bushbeck's brigade. Hubert Dilger, commanding a battery and supported by the 61st Ohio, would fire and retreat via recoil to try to ward off the oncoming rebels. His action would earn him the Medal of Honor. We're going to see Dilger and his battery again. After Chancellorsville, they're going to be involved with Gettysburg. And then, actually again, his battery is going to be used in the targeted strike on Bishop Leonidas Polk in the outskirts of Atlanta, so stay tuned for that as well. As the darkness set in, Rhodes would request that his men be replaced with those of A.P. Hill. Hill's fresh division could continue the assault. All in all, the attack had only produced some 2,000 Union casualties, most of them captured. Jackson's philosophy was to keep the enemy in flight, wishing to continue the attack. Skirmishers were thrown out before the main rebel line. Now, crucially, in the evaporating light, there had been a troop of the 8th Pennsylvania Cavalry who had rode out without having been made aware of the Confederate assault. They would find themselves in between the pickets and the main rebel line. Wishing to make a break, they would cut their way with sabers out of their pickle with heavy casualties. Because of this, the Confederates would be wary of mounted parties. As was his custom, Jackson would wish to reconnoiter the enemy, ready to keep the offensive going in the darkness. This is something we've seen before. He does it before the assault here even begins. He does this at Second Bull Run, famously. Remember we talked about that, how some of the Union troops even write about how they see a lone Confederate writer, and that very well could have been Jackson. By evening, Jackson's men had advanced fairly close to Chancellorsville itself, nearby to the Bullock Farm. Jackson and his staff would ride forward with a local guide, a cavalryman, who was from the area. This would be along the Mounted Road, which runs parallel to our main plank road, and does connect to the Bullock Road, which runs toward U.S. Ford. Upon their return to the main line, North Carolinians from James Lane's brigade would open fire and wound Jackson with three hits, two to the arm. A member of his staff was also wounded, and another was killed. Now, I think it's important that we read, if not a first-hand account, at least an account from a contemporary, and this is from Henry Kidd Douglas's memoir. Rumors came from the front that the enemy were massing and getting ready to make a charge down the road from Chancellorsville. General Jackson, determined to investigate for himself, put aside all warnings and rode directly to the front with Boswell, Morrison, and Wilburn of his staff, and several couriers and others. Crutchfield was already in the front, locating and directing some artillery. It does not seem likely that the general went directly along the road, but evidently went through our lines at another position. Actually, this is sort of true. Jackson gets fired upon by some artillery, and then they need to divert off the main road. It seems now an unnecessary as well as fatal thing for him to do. He was soon fired upon by a squad of the enemy, and several horses were shot. I believe from that I heard at the time that by that volley, General Jackson was shot through the right hand. Warned that they were actually in the lines of the enemy, the little cavalcade galloped off to the left and rear into the shelter of the wood. Suddenly from the rear came a cry of Yankee cavalry and a sharp volley from Confederate guns ran out of the night and sent death among its friends. It's not technically true. Douglas is actually not there during the actual wounding, but a little off. He uh, does not actually get wounded by any Yankee fires, all from uh, Confederate guns. General Jackson was shot through the left arm, below the shoulder, and in the left wrist. 
Boswell, gallant, chivalric Boswell from from his horse, shot through the heart. Morrison had his horse shot from under him. Captain Howard, a staff officer with Hill, was also wounded. Captain Forbes was killed, and Sergeant Cunliffe mortally wounded. The courier just behind the general was killed, and another wounded. A number of horses were killed or wounded. Little Sorrel became frantic with fright, rushed first toward the enemy, then, being turned by the general with his wounded hand, broke again to the rear. The general was struck in the face by a hanging limb, his cap was knocked from his head, and when he was reeling from his saddle, his horse was stopped by Captain Wilburn, into whose arms he fell. Suddenly, the enemy's artillery opened on the scene and added to the confusion and horror of it. Others of the party were killed or wounded, and verily, in the language of General Sherman, war was held that night. Pendleton came and rode rapidly away for a surgeon. McGuire soon came and found that Dr. Barr of Hill's command had been doing what he could for the general. Colonel Crutchfield, Jackson's chief of artillery, had been badly injured by a shot in the leg, which disabled him for a year. Captain Benjamin Watkins Lay served that day on Hill's staff, afterwards killed at Gettysburg, had his horse killed, and was wounded slightly while helping Smith, who had come up, and Morrison to carry the general to the rear. It was a pandemonium of death and confusion, but above it all rose the iron purpose and commands of Jackson to General Pender and others to hold their positions. So there we have a little flavor of the scene as it would have probably been described to Douglas. A.P. Hill, who had been following Jackson, would likewise come under fire, all the members of his staff being killed or wounded. Now the why is fairly obvious. There had been Federal cavalry operating in the area, as well as infantry pockets a little further to the south. It was not unusual to think the mounted party were the enemy. Regardless, Jackson would have to be removed from the field. A.P. Hill would be wounded via an artillery shell from the Federals, who were alerted because of the shooting. Jackson would effectively be knocked out of the fight. His secretive movements had cost him dearly. No one was alerted to his presence in the area, and likewise, there really was not a good idea as to the plan of attack. His wounding would actually cease the assault, which gave the initiative back to the Yankees who were digging in. The inexperience of the other division commanders would be shown as Jeb Stewart would have to take charge of the Corps, only have commanding infantry once before at Trainsville. Jackson was unable to give him direction. A.P. Hill possibly also wanted to avoid being blamed for a Confederate failure did not help. While the flank march and attack had been a success, Lee could not have known just what a significant blow had just been dealt his army long term. Robert Rhodes had declined command of a corps when it was offered to him, and probably not just because he was new even to division command. The situation for the Confederates was not necessarily the best. Jackson's forces were still on the other side of the Union Army from Anderson and McClaws. While there had been some demonstrating on that side of the field, Lee knew it could only be a matter of time before Hooker decided to, in detail, take out that side of the field before then turning to Jackson's remaining troops. Stewart is going to get in touch with Lee, Lee of course receiving word of Jackson's wounding. The assault would begin again on the next day. A.P. Hill's men would kick things off. Colston's and then Rhodes' divisions would follow up. Before Stonewall was hit, the general idea had been to drive the enemy away from U.S. Ford. This could still be done, the Federals cut off from their escape and may be destroyed. Good for Robert E. Lee, Hooker decides to be on the defensive yet again. Not only does he decide to be defensive, but besides calling off the attack on May 1st, he probably does the second most puzzling thing during the battle. He withdraws from the high ground at Hazel Grove. Too much of a salient had been remaining in the Federal lines, but Hooker does have enough men to man such a position. Now there was still artillery and high ground at Fairview, closer to the Orange Turnpike, but the Federals would abandon earthworks already made. Now the Federal line resembled a kind of U, with the salient south of the turnpike. Sickles, Slocum, and Couch would make up the Corps, who were manning these positions. Sickles would want to conduct a movement in the darkness, which would result in sporadic skirmishing between the two sides, but mostly friendly fire incidents in the Federal ranks. Artillery would fire blindly into what they thought were the enemy, 
A Michigan regiment would capture a battery, only to find out it was in fact a northern unit. Sickles had been a brigade commander under Hooker, so I feel that he gives him a pass during this campaign. These night moves were unfortunate and unnecessary actions by a subpar corps commander. I know that might sting some people a little bit. A lot of folks think that Sickles does a good job at Gettysburg, and trust me, we will talk in depth about Sickles and exactly what he does at Gettysburg here in July. Early on May 3rd, the Confederates would renew the assault, starting with A.P. Hill's men. They were able to see some success by assaulting the corner of the Federal line, but the Union troops were still taking advantage of their earthworks and strong positions. Stewart does an okay job of renewing the attack, which is what Robert E. Lee wants, but he does not do a good job of feeling out for a weak spot in the line. Confederate attacks were head-on, and would cost much in terms of loss. Wooded terrain would be important to masking movements and confusing the enemy. The Excelsior Brigade actually marches away from the fighting as a result. Likewise, Hooker does not have a central artillery command, so there is little in direction for repelling assaults or otherwise neutralizing the Confederate artillery. Chancellorsville would then be a rare example of the rebel artillery under Edward Porter Alexander, surpassing their counterparts. Alexander had taken over for Stapleton Crutchfield, who, if you recall, we just read from Douglas, was actually wounded. There would be some shifting of units by the Federal commander, but... Another fault of the action on this day would be that Meade and Reynolds, along with their corps, would be held back, possibly protecting against being cut off from the river and the fords, possibly also ready to flank Jackson's command. But we're never really going to know. James Archer's Confederates would start off the major assaults by attacking Thomas Ruger's mixed brigade, which included the 27th Indiana, who recovered Lee's order prior to South Mountain. More and more rebels would be thrown against the Union works, which would hold for some time. While A.P. Hill's men would lead the way, Colston and Rhodes would also move into the action. Meanwhile, Anderson would swing south and hit the Federals under Bernie of the Third Corps. McClaws, who had pressured Slocum, would attack again, so the Union would be hit from multiple locations. Casualties were fearful. James Lang, whose North Carolina troops had wounded Stonewall the night before, would cry remember Jackson before assaulting the enemy. Lane would be reduced to tears before the end of the fighting at the incredible loss. Elisha Frank Paxton, who had been a native of Lexington, Virginia, and friend to Thomas J. Jackson, would be killed leading the Stonewall Brigade in this action. Stephen Ramsier's brigade would step on Virginia regiments who had refused to keep moving forward. Brian Grimes of the 4th would write that he took particular pleasure in stepping on the back of the head of a high-ranking officer. Ramsur, whose men would break the Union line at long last, would likewise be brought to tears by the amount of casualties his brigade suffers. A little to the north of the Plank Road, and where Thomas's brigade of Georgians is almost able to end the battle early. His men would potentially flank the Union artillery, but well-timed federal reinforcements would end the venture. These men would come in the form of William French's men from Couch's II Corps. Now, Jeb Stewart had reportedly donned a blue federal uniform and was riding amongst the attackers. This blue attire would save his life as he approached a unit he believed to be firing on fellow Confederates, stopping when he realized they were in fact Yankees. Hiram Barry, division commander in the 3rd Corps, would be killed by a sharpshooter while on the plank road. The 114th Pennsylvania, also in the 3rd Corps, would suffer heavily after the Union lines began to waver. Sickles would attempt to hold steady his troops, but he realized that things were starting to be dire. Meanwhile, Confederate artillery would continue to make an impact with their firing position at Hazel Grove. Union artillery, we mentioned, was set up very close to the Chancellor's house. Hooker would pick this moment, the most inopportune time to be near a rebel artillery blast, hitting a post of the Chancellor's house and knocking him out. Originally thought to be dead, Hooker would most likely be concussed as a result, narrowly avoiding being blown to bits by another southern shot. It probably would have been better had Darius Couch taken over for the Army of the Potomac, but Hooker would be back in the saddle before long. His directive would be to pull the army back to a new defensive line. 
as the Federals collapsed, the cannon fire continued to wreak havoc on the fugitives. One artilleryman described it like pie, one that you usually have to pay for before acquiring, so there was no hesitation. A brigade of Hancock's division would be diverted to stop the Confederate advance, which, to their credit, they did. Hancock's Second Corps boys would perform probably the best of any Union troops during the battle. They held the line on May 1st, repulsed attacks on the 2nd, which to be fair were really more or less feints, and they had been engaged on the same ground against more determined attacks from McClaws on the 3rd. Nelson Miles of the 61st New York would be hit in the abdomen and receive the Medal of Honor on this part of the field. Despite their performance, the Confederates would hold on to their hard-earned ground. Lee would only have the briefest of moments to enjoy the success before he was called elsewhere. So to figure out why, we need to back up just a bit, actually to May 2nd, and check in at Fredericksburg. Early Remember had received orders to pull out from his defenses, which included Murray's Heights. Sedgwick, like many other officers in the Civil War, would operate better if he had direct orders, telling him what to do. Thaddeus Lowe and his observation balloon would inform Sedgwick that the Confederates were pulling out, but he would still do nothing. All throughout the battle, there would be problems with communications between Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg. So the orders he did receive were allowing for his creative license. Early would be able to move back into his lines the next day. Barksdale and his Mississippi Brigade were left to check the Federals. Barksdale reportedly responded when asked if he was sleeping that he could not when he was surrounded by Yankees. After the battle, Barksdale and Early would bicker over whose fault it was and if their Mississippi regiments received the proper support from their division commander. Cedric was given a clear order to assault the enemy on May 3rd. Early would set up with his 11,000 men occupying a line that was far longer than what the rebel army had occupied in December of 1862. Now, Early thought, and honestly, rightfully so, I think that the Federals would not try a direct assault on Marie's Heights. Two Mississippi regiments from Barksdale and a few pieces from the Washington Artillery would man this same position, with the other forces in Early's contingent lined up elsewhere. That position, along the infamous stone wall, was in danger of potentially being flanked, so that was where the focus would be. Cedric would have divisions under Albion Howe, Billy Brooks, and John Newton, and one light division under Hiram Burnham. It would be the light division along with the men from Newton's command who would advance along the same ground that had seen so much carnage in December. They would do so in columns, not capping their weapons so as not to stop and fire. This, combined with the lighter defenders, would break the Confederate line and gain the heights, although still with around a thousand or so casualties, which is significantly less than before. Heavy hand-to-hand -hand fighting occurred at the wall, which resulted in the surrender of many of the Mississippi men. Early's directive had been to withdraw to the south and protect the railroad, which he was allowed to do, the stunned Yankees allowing for Harry Hayes' brigade to retreat, even though they could very well have bagged them. Sedgwick would then start advancing down the Orange Plank Road, seriously threatening Lee's rear now, the Confederate Army, though, would have an unlikely savior in Cadmus Wilcox and his Alabama Brigade, who had not seen action yet during the battle. Wilcox desperately wanted a promotion, so he would act quickly, wanting to take the initiative and show his value. His men would set up a defensive line around a toll gate on the plank road, and then a strong position with natural cover around Salem Church, which contained also a schoolhouse. Units from McClaw's division would double-time it to this line, adding to the Confederate defenders. Sedgwick, who is still really not going to know exactly what to do, is going to miss out on the opportunity to overwhelm the smaller number of defenders. With the troops left to garrison Fredericksburg, he would still have some 22,500 men and would be advancing toward them down the road. This would be led by Brooks' division. Billy Brooks had served in the war with Mexico and saw sporadic action throughout the Civil War, being wounded at Savage's Station. He will resign from the army before the end of the war due to health. 
Wilcox and his Alabama men were directly in the center of the Rebel line, ready to receive the attacking force. These units included the New Jersey Brigade under Colonel Henry Brown and a mixed brigade under Joseph Bartlett. Initially, the attack was a success. The Federals able to push back the Alabama troops, although reinforcements were getting into line. Confederates fortified the church and the schoolhouse, which was captured in the assault. The 9th and 10th Alabama would rally and pour devastating fire into the flanks of the 123rd New York, commanded on the day by Emory Upton. The 123rd was a rookie regiment, but performed well, sustaining the most casualties on the day in this section of the battlefield. The New Jersey Brigade would also take losses, as the Union infantry was forced to retreat, although artillery dissuaded a counter-thrust. Salem Church would save Lee's army from suddenly finding Sedgwick in his rear, although we can also probably blame Uncle John as the 6th Corps commander was known for being overly cautious and slow-moving. When Lee had been told of the movements down the plank road, he had said, I do not think Major Sedgwick means us much harm. Sedgwick had served under Lee before the war, and so that is why he is his old army rank. Fighting had died down in the Chancellorsville sector, Colston probing toward Hooker before digging in. May 4th would pass without much action. Lee would leave Stewart and move in an attempt to destroy Sedgwick, although there were problems getting all his men into line. An ill-fated attack by Harry Hayes and his Louisiana regiments was easily repulsed. This was actually the handiwork of Jubal Early, who had hatched a plan to cut off Sedgwick from Fredericksburg and then drive him from the field. Sedgwick had already pretty much done so, his line resembling a kind of U, now west of the city, and his back was to the river. Without support from McClaws or Anderson, Early would not succeed. Amazingly, Hooker was not really interested in supporting his subordinate officer. It seems that the Army of the Potomac was worried about what exactly would come out of the wilderness. It baffles me personally that Hooker was wanting Sedgwick to rescue him, although Hooker had more than three times the amount of troops currently around Salem Church. Rumors that Longstreet had arrived were all over the place, Jubal Early actually being mistaken for these reinforcements as his men came up from their position on the RF&P Railroad. Artillery duels would occur around the main battlefield on the 4th, as well as sharpshooting. Emil Whipple would be killed by a well-placed rebel shot, the 2nd, 3rd Corps Division Commander to die in the contest. Hooker would hold a council of war on the night of the 4th. Many of his officers elected to stay and fight. In fact, Meade and Reynolds, as well as Howard, were ready to renew the offensive. Sickles was unsure, as was Couch, making the vote 3-2. to two. Hooker had hatched a plan to get at the Confederates again, but would not go through with this new course of action. The communication problems persisted, Sedgwick being told to withdraw, then hold his ground, the withdrawal already well underway. If we look at it though, there was much Hooker still could have done to salvage the campaign. The Army of the Potomac has done well in bolstering their defensive line, and artillery is going to be centralized once again. It's actually going to be placed back under Henry Hunt. We met him before. He had some great success at Malvern Hill, so why not duplicate that success again? This was put on display as Colston probed toward the northern pieces. It was a good base to operate from for further action. Even so, Hooker will order a retreat back across the fords. Reynolds would lead the way with the 1st Corps. Some of the generals would drag their feet in getting their men across the river, a last defiant act toward fighting Joe. Hooker had not succeeded in pulling off his master plan, but likewise Lee had failed to destroy the Army of the Potomac. So, we can bring the Battle of Chancellorsville to a close. Overall, the army suffered greatly, 17,000 Union casualties as opposed to 13,000 Confederate. Fires would be started in the dense wilderness, which would unfortunately be the end of many wounded on both sides, something that would be a repeat during the 1864 battle. May 3rd of the Battle of Chancellorsville was a heavy toll. It would be the bloodiest day short of Antietam, which speaks to the fierce fighting.
Lee would have to immediately turn around and recommend promotions, which illustrates just how many regimental officers he lost during the assaults in the wilderness. Next week, I want to talk about the significance of the battle, so we will start off there. We also need to swing back around and look into what is going on since Grant has gained the east bank of the Mississippi River. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be links to the website as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.